Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason from Jacobin Magazine. Uh, welcome to the first event in the ABC's of Socialism series. Each Monday uh, this month, we're going to be discussing a common question asked by people who are newly discovering socialism or a basic that we can return to for those of you who have been been around a bit longer. Um, each of these questions is a chapter from the ABCs of Socialism, which was produced uh, by Bhaskar Sankara and the editors of Jacobin Magazine and published by Verso Books. Uh, so I want to thank Verso for publishing the book, but also for opening the space to us. It's gorgeous. They've been doing the video. It's tremendous. Um, we owe them a ton of thanks. Uh, the, ABCs, the ABCs of Socialism was originally produced in the early part of 2016, but we're having these events now because at Jacobin we've seen an absolute explosion uh, of interest in socialism after Trump's electoral victory, the first months of the presidency, and after liberalism's complete inability to mount any sort of credible challenge, that people are sort of, ex there's an explosion of interest. Um, in the past few months, we've seen 10,000 new subscribers to Jacobin. Uh, this book has gone into its second printing in just a few short months. Uh, and then hundreds have been attending different reading groups across the country or events across the country, and that's just one sort of slice uh, uh, of the pie. Uh, for all the enthusiasm that's out there, we know that there's actually quite a bit more, that there's other people who are still discovering socialism, coming to socialism. Um, we'll have many more questions, and, and we don't pretend to have the, all of the answers to all the questions that people are going to be bringing us. But we produce the ABCs of socialism in the hope that we could produce a tool to help welcome those people with some clear, convincing answers. Uh, so I'm really excited that our first speaker in this series is Vivek Chibber. Uh, Vivek is the author of Postcolonial Theory and the Specter of Capital, which is also published by Verso Books. That book spawned a series of debates, uh, which was recently captured in another Verso book, uh, The Debate on Postcolonial Theory and the Specter of Capital. Uh, when the original book came out, I, I had the chance to interview Vivek. Uh, we talked about postcolonial theory, a number of other uh, questions ranging from, from uh, Marxism to postcolonial theory to revolutions to the role of the intellectuals. And what he said, I still sort of come back to, uh, which was that historically on the left, intellectuals always took it as their duty to take complex matters and to present them in a simple and clear way. And that is how you organize people. And I think that's true and that's really important for us to remember today as, as, as the numbers of people who are interested in what we have to say are growing so, so rapidly and so widely. But it, and it's what we were shooting for when we produced the ABCs of Socialism. It's also sort of the first quality I think of when I think of Vivek Chibber, who's able to, ab to absolutely condense uh, very complicated issues, things that people don't necessarily have their heads around in a way that, that is immediately accessible to people who aren't necessarily familiar with the subject. So we're really excited to have him here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited. Hopefully we'll welcome Vivek. Uh, just to uh, remind people about the format for tonight, Vivek is going to speak for about 15 minutes on the question about why socialists talk so much about workers. Then I'm going to ask him a few questions for about 15 minutes. Uh, then we'll let the folks at home uh, go and do whatever they're doing tonight. And then we'll have a discussion here for, for another hour or whatever people want to ask questions about. So with, with that, uh, let's welcome Vivek Chibber. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I've been, I lived in this country now for 35 years, and um, it's been mostly a very depressing time except for these last four or five years. And it's been pretty amazing to see in the United States, which I had sort of thought I would not see in my lifetime, something like the emergence of at least the first glimmer of a genuine political culture. I don't think we're there yet. It's going to take a very long time for it to happen. But at least uh, people are coming out and starting to think about uh, the way in which society as a whole works and what kinds of issues it'll take, what kinds of mechanisms and drives it'll take to actually change that society. For uh, it, towards this, I think this series that Jacobin is putting out on socialism, the talks that Jason is organizing play a very important role. And I'm, I'm amazed to see so many of you out here uh, on, a, on a cold night. Uh, all this portends well, I think, for us. Uh, let's see how, how long it goes on. But as long as the moment is there, I think we should try to do everything we can to deepen it and to take advantage of it. The issue before us today is uh, why socialists constantly or uh, an inordinate amount of time focus on the working class as a strategic factor in society. Now, I think, to get straight to the point, there are a couple of fundamental reasons why socialists do so, and I think they're very sound reasons. And you can think of this as a, one being a diagnosis of what's wrong in modern society, and the second being a prognosis of what to do to make things better. Both of these point in the same direction. So let's start with a diagnosis. 
The diagnosis focuses on what kinds of things people need in their life to have a decent shot at um, happiness, at uh, uh, at decent social relations with others, all the things that go into what we call justice, fairness and justice. And whatever else is needed, and there are many things that are needed for social justice, there are two that just about everybody agrees on. One is certain basic minimum material goods. People cannot lead decent lives if they are constantly worried about having enough to eat. They cannot lead a decent life if they don't have basic health, if they don't have housing, if they don't have certain material provisions that go into consolidating their everyday life so that they can strive for what they would regard as a higher end of things, creativity, love, uh, friendship. All of those things are harder to sustain when you don't have certain basic goods. So first of all, you need these goods. Secondly, for lack of a better term, autonomy. Or you can think of it in a more cumbersome way, uh, freedom from domination. The basic idea is if you are under somebody else's thumb, if you're being dominated by somebody else, there's always a chance that that authority which they have over you uh, will turn into abuse. And being dominated by somebody else, therefore, means that the priorities by which you live are not going to be your own. They're going to be the priorities of that person who has power over you, which means that you don't essentially get to set your agenda, whatever that agenda might be. Therefore, if in modern society people lack these basic material goods and they lack autonomy, that is to say they're they experience domination, whatever else they need, it's going to be a society in which justice is very hard to achieve. Now, what socialists say is that capitalism is a social system which systematically deprives people of both of these, both the material goods that they need and their autonomy. And the reason is simple. Capitalism runs on the principle of profit maximization. Or to put it differently, it puts profits over people. Now, why does that undermine both of these things? Well, most people in a capitalist society have to work for a living, and they go to work for somebody else. While they're working for somebody else, their employer, the employer's priorities are not set by what is good for the employees who are working under his authority. It's set by the firm's goal of maximizing profits. And the reason he has to prioritize the profit maximization principle is if he does not maximize his profits, he dies. The firm dies. Because the only way he can survive is by wringing as much money as he can out of his economic activities so he can take that money, in, increase his efficiency, increase his competitive strengths so that he can b beat out his rivals. The thrust and the force of competition compels capitalists to always look after the bottom line. Now, the bottom line ends up being injurious to everybody else. And this is the fundamental problem. The flip side of profit maximization is cost minimization. Every firm has to try to maintain, the, its hold its line on whatever cost it has so as the profit margins can be increased as much as possible. But cost minimization has an immediate impact on workers' lives because what they take as their income, which is their wage, is their employer's cost. So cost minimization means that every employer tries to pay as little as he can get away with when it comes to remunerating his workers, which means that workers, therefore, have to constantly be under the threat of their basic means of livelihood being set not by what they need, but what by their employer can get away with. That's issue number one. Issue number two, while they're at work, they have to surrender their autonomy to their employer. The wage contract essentially says, I'll come and work for you. You give me some money. And for the duration that I'm working for you, I am under your authority. What I do with my time, where I stand, where I go, who I talk to, how many bathroom breaks I get, where I look, how fast I work, is not at my discretion. It's at the discretion of the employer. And that waking time, for most people in the world, is most of their waking day. That working time comprises anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths of all the time that they're awake, which means, effectively, if you think of a person's active life as the time of their life that they're waking through the day, it means three-fourths of their waking time is under a loss of autonomy to somebody whose interests are reined up, uh, lined up against their own interests. This lack of autonomy inside the workplace is oftentimes compounded by having being under their employer's control outside the workplace. 
in company towns, in cities where uh, judges and legislators are bought up by the employer, even uh, political authority is under the capitalist hands. Therefore, for both of these reasons, it is built into the structure of capitalism that these fundamental uh, preconditions for a just society are systematically undermined by the rules of the system itself. All right, so what that means, therefore, is that in order to move towards a more just social arrangement, you have got to figure out how to get people these basic provisions and greater autonomy. And this has been the struggle of the poor since the birth of capitalism, trying to establish non-market access, or at least non-contingent access, to these things which they need for decent lives. The problem is, every time the poor have tried to advocate, or ask for, or plead for, greater uh, insurance of these things, they've every time, everywhere, come up against the resistance of their employers. Within the workplace, if they ask for higher wages, if they ask for more control over the workplace, if they ask for more authority over investment decisions, every time it comes up against the uh, uh, recalcitrance of the employers. And also, uh, when it comes to outside the workplace, because of the employer's greater social power. The basic problem is, power in capitalism is not distributed equally. Not only do employers get to set the agenda within the workplace, they also have the authority and the power to set the agenda for society at large because of their control of the state, because of their greater resources for lobbying, because of their ability to buy politicians, and fundamentally because as long as they control investment, they control the creation of all the wealth and all the income of society, so everybody has to constantly worry about whether or not they're happy. This leads to a strategic problem, which is if the vast majority of the people in a capitalist society are denied the basic goods that are needed for social justice, and if every time they ask for them, they are denied to them by political authorities because of the influence of the capitalist class, how do you get them? Now, this leads then to the second factor after the diagnosis, which is the prognosis of how to fix things. The prognosis is, in order to have a better chance of life for the vast majority of the people, since power centers are not going to give them up voluntarily, you're going to have to extract it from them through a countervailing power on the part of the poor. It's a practical issue. The practical issue is, if the bourgeois state and the capitalist class, which has the power, does not allow the poor, by its own generosity, these basic things that it needs for justice, where is it going to get the means to get it from them? And the answer can only be by extracting it from them through a countervailing power on the part of the poor. And this is where the strategic and practical uh, importance of the working class comes in. The working class is unlike any other social grouping in the non-capitalist section of modern society, which is that however penurious it is, however dominated it is, however uh, 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 atomized it is, it is the goose that lays the golden egg. It is the source of profits because unless workers show up to do their work every day and create profits for their employers, that principle of profit maximization cannot be carried out. It remains a dead letter. Workers, therefore, have the following opportunity, if they can take advantage of it, which is that they hold the lever to the sluice, the, the, the stream of profits that keeps the system going. Capitalists have the authority over them, but unless they agree to do what their employers say, the employers are left simply holding the bag, no profits for them. Workers, therefore, become important for a strategic reason, which is that they're the agent, and the only agent, that has a structural place within the society to bring the power centers to their knees. Now, that is a capacity that they have, but they also have an interest and using that capacity for obvious reasons. All of those liabilities, all of those constraints which I've laid out, which are in the way of moving towards a more just society, are most keenly felt in society as a whole by the working class itself. They are the vast majority of uh, modern society. They also happen to be, I'm gonna finish way before, among the poorest end, and they are the ones who every day suffer the indignities, the deprivation, the loss of autonomy, the backbreaking work pace, the insecurity and the anxiety of what to do with their lives when they're under somebody else's thumb, they're the ones who suffer this. And hence, they therefore have not only a capacity, 
but also in interest, in coming together, banding together, and struggling f towards those ends which we think would generate more s just social uh, arrangements. All right, so for socialists, therefore, they learn through hard experience that if you want to have a better society, you're going to have to aggregate power in some way. And this is, even today, the power center of society. Now, there's an important implication of this for this, especially since many of you are people in and around universities and university crowds, and you've, had, you've suffered the misfortune of sitting through social theory classes and all that in the last 20 years. Uh, among progressives and in the radical left, the key category in the last 25 years has been the margins, marginality. Embracing the margins, advocating for the margins, being the margins, loving the margins. If it's marginal, it's good. Not that there's anything wrong with the margins. But understand this. The reason the working class is important is because it's not marginal. And you're going to have to get over your love of the margins if you want to do effective politics. This doesn't mean that you consign minority groups, other social oppressed groups, to insignificance. Quite the contrary. Anybody fighting for a just society has to take every form of marginalization and oppression as being incredibly important. But understand that politics is not just about moral advocacy. It is also about the practicalities of achieving power against the power centers in an unjust world. The thing about the working class that makes it important is that it is central. It is the central social category and social group within capitalism, of course, second only to capital. Which means, therefore, that the reason you go after it is because of its centrality to the system, not because of its marginality. And that means that the tenor of political debates has to change. Quite often, you walk into a meeting today, and the discussion will be about whether or not this group is fighting for the margins, is looking for the margins, is bringing the margins in. And that's great if it's a code word for saying we have to make sure every indignity, every injustice is something that we're concerned with. But understand that you also have to ask who are the central and the key players in this society that can bring the kind of changes we need. And therefore, not just in our politics, but in our understanding of the system, we have to move beyond the obsessions with margins. And we have to start thinking about the nucleus, the core, and the foundation of modern society and building and establishing power within those foundations. Right now, at this moment, the left is the weakest it has been since its birth on this issue. And one reason it's embraced the margins is that that's the space that it inhabits. But the fact that you've been pushed into the margins doesn't mean you should embrace it. The agenda for the left for the foreseeable future is going to be to figure out how to get out of the margins into the nerve centers of capitalism, because that's where the power is. And until you're able to aggregate and use that power towards different ends, you're not going to get the kind of society that most moral people want. That's why socialists focus on the working class, and I think they're right to do so. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks Vivek. That, that was that was fantastic. Uh, I think it was incredibly useful. I have uh, just a few questions to maybe elaborate on some on some of the things that you said, and then again we can kick it open to the to the discussion. Um, so the first place I want to start with was, was where you started with capitalism. I mean, in the in the in the book you say capitalism can't deliver the goods, and you know I'd like to start there because I think it's important how firm you are on this, both in the book and, and in the talk that you just gave. Because when cri criticism of capitalism does make it into mainstream discussions, it's usually of the sort of that late capitalism has gone off the rails or it's neoliberal capitalism. It's some sort of variant of capitalism that has really just gone amok. Um, and, I, and I think what you're suggesting here and what you're saying outright is that capitalism will inevitably produce injustice. And then as a result, it will inevitably generate class conflict, right? So I was just hoping you could maybe address that a little more. Yeah. Um, two ways to look at this. Uh, you're absolutely right that the um, the code word for everything now has become neoliberalism, and it's, be it's become the stand-in for anything that counts as a genuine analysis of modern society. And that's partly because um, much of the left di discourse is uh, overwhelmingly dominated by uh, nonprofits and academics. And capitalism is still a no-no. You, you can't really bring up capitalism. So you, so you need something else. And it's, it's very useful to say, well, it's not capitalism as such that we worry about. It's, it's this right here. It's Reaganism, it's Thatcherism, that sort of thing. And 
there's no doubt that the current variant of capitalism is truly inhumane, uh, certainly more so than the one that preceded it. So uh, that, that's one reason why you don't see the word capitalism very much. But first of all, it's important to understand that if you look, if you compare today's version of capitalism with its place in history, it's actually not the exception. We are reverting back to capitalism's uh, pure form. This, this is what it is. What it is is a system in which everybody is thrown out onto the market and they're told, sink or swim, man. It's up to you. The era of getting social supports, some kind of social insurance, uh, basic guarantees, the welfare state, that was an era that's been around now since about the 1930s and 40s. But it was a departure from the norm in capitalism. So in a sense, we're going back. Neoliberalism is actually simply just capitalism in its pure face. Now, there's two ways, as I said, you can look at this. One is um, on an absolute scale. Does capitalism on an absolute level actually deny people what they need on an everyday, at an everyday level? And the answer is for most of the world, even on that absolute scale, it fails. It fails because most of the world now is in a, in a very unalloyed, barbaric form of a market society in India, in China, in Africa, uh, in the Middle East. These are all places in which the vast, vast majority of the people still live barely at a subsistence level. And that's not an accident. That's because of the fact that they have to work for employers that simply don't care what's going on for them. So on an absolute scale, for the most of the world, it is failing. The other way to look at it is on a relative scale, which is like in a country like this, in, a con in countries like Western Europe, it's of course true that poor people, the working people, have gotten a lot for themselves, and their lives are actually quite decent. But what we say, when we say, when we bring up a relative scale, what we mean by that is not just relative to the rest of the world as is, but relative to how they could be living given the state of productivity, given the state of technology, given the state of the country's infrastructure, could their lives be better than they are now? And the answer is absolutely. Hmm? Um, finally, to the extent, and this is the key point, to the extent that workers in the West have managed to get better lives for themselves, this has come about because they aggregated their power precisely in the way that I was saying. The reason the welfare state arose in the West at the time that it did was because of enormous and violent class struggle in which labor unions managed to extract these concessions from employers in a way that had not been possible previously. So as long as you have capitalism, this not only are you going to have to fight for everything that you have, but those things that you have are constantly going to be under threat from the employers who never wanted to give them to you in the first place. And the, 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 that, that fight that I talked about, that antagonism between employers and employees, therefore, is written into the system. You're not going to get rid of it. And this is why socialists have said, you can have a more civilized capitalism, and you should fight for that more civilized capitalism, but understand that it's like a cancer. You can keep giving it chemo. You can beat back the growth of the cancer cells, but they always keep coming back. And that's why you want a different system. So, so the, the, the main argument of the piece is that workers are the key social agent. These are the, this is the revolutionary agent. Uh, so I guess it's important to actually say what a worker is. And, and what I mean by that is, in the last five years, you talked about this, these enormous uh, explosions of social struggle. So, you know, Occupy Wall Street is where a lot of this started, which was fantastic. It put on the map the sort of idea of 1% versus the 99%, which was really useful because all of a sudden you have millions of people talking about just vast gulf of, you know, the huge inequality in the society on every level. Um, but at the same time, what it does is, is it sort of enshrines a conception of class as how much you make or, or how, much you, how much you own, right? Which isn't exactly what we mean. So, so what, what is a worker? Let's start with a step slightly uh, further back in the way you presented it, because I think it's a good way to think about it, which is that it, it's been a very effective rhetorical tool to talk about the 1% versus everybody else. And that everybody else is defined as a negative category, whoever is not in the 1%. And the assumption is, or the implication is, that they all um, not only are worse off than the 1%, but they can all come together in some way uh, as an effective social group. And on a very narrow range of issues, that's true. Uh, people, the 99% the is going to have certain common interests. But uh, a, a significant chunk of that 99% are people who we'd never call workers. They're going to be managers. They're going to be people who have a great deal of uh, autonomy, who own their own means of production. And therefore, for some of them, like the managers, 
even though they're not in the 1%, their job is to make the 1% happy by getting more work out of the bottom 60%. And while right now they may not be getting as much money and making, have as much wealth as the 1%, they aspire to be and they will try to be in that 1% because there's an actual chance for them to do so at some point. Up on top in society, there's a game of musical chairs. Employers have managers, managers go up a ladder, and the way you make it up the ladder is by screwing over the people underneath you. That's your job. So for the kinds of ends that we are talking about, of actually bringing people together around an agenda to push employers to give up some of their profits for higher wages and other things, uh, it's, managers aren't going to be part of that. And that's why you've never had unions trying to bring in managers, because they know that you're essentially bringing in your enemy. And what that means, therefore, is that this language of incomes being, income being the divider or these percentage points being the, div the divider is rhetorically and in some narrow ways useful, but it's strategically and politically not very useful. And you'll run up against that problem all the time. The key thing for an analysis of capitalism is not what your income is, but what you have to do to earn your income. And I can't say this often enough. It's what you have to do to earn your income. And if what you have to do to earn your income is boss and manage other people, then you're not going to be part of that movement. That's what managers do. On the other hand, what you have to do is submit to the authority and the depredations of these managers and their employers. Now you've got a reason to try to fight against them. That's why class is not the same thing as income groups. Class is fundamentally about which side of the divide you're on, whether you're extracting labor or whether it's your labor that's being extracted. So the, the next question I have is, is you know, sort of, uh, rhetorical, but do, uh, I mean, ironic. It, it, do workers still exist? Is what I have written down here. And the reason I have that is because, you know, there's arguments out there that workers have won important gains in the past, uh, but they're not a relevant force today, right? And so every few decades, there's this sort of new theory that gets, that emerges that the working class is disappearing for one reason or another. Um, today, I was, you know, when preparing for this, I was reading some stuff and I saw. Uh, one such call to to like rethink Marxism entirely. It, it's it read the automatic process. The automation process continually replaces the manual worker. When these developments reach a certain point, the whole Marxian thesis will need substantial revision. And that was written in 1933, right? So like, <laughs> it, which is to say that we hear these things dusted off every couple of decades. It's a brand new cutting edge, th cutting edge theory about why the working class is irrelevant. Um, and so I would uh, include in that that the US is post-industrial, that automization has now re you know, replaced workers or will soon, that we all live in a gig economy, that we're, that we're too precarious. Um, so it's clearly true that working conditions are changing, and that does mean something, right? But does that change the position and the role of the working class? You know, I mean, I, I would guess you would say no, but why? Why not? We should not be too quick to say no. Um, first of all, no in a big sense. Nothing is new in the current structure of capitalism in, a, in any deep sense. Automation per se, as you, it was very clever what you did, um, this view that automation is eventually going to end in everybody being out of work and robots running everything, mm, it, 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 it is not true and it can't be true. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, it is, of course, the case that automation con continually throws people out of uh, their particular workplace. But the, the effects of that mm, throwing these people out are always counterbalanced by two things. One is that in a growing economy, if productivity is increasing and the tempo of economic growth is always on the upswing, new firms and new factories and new plants and new places of work are, are springing up all the time, which then suck up the workers who were thrown out of work by the automation. So there's a dual process going on of some people being thrown out and then those people being sucked up by new firms. This view that automation will result in everybody eventually losing their jobs uh, kind of screens out and ignores this second counterbalancing thing. It just assumes that the existing factories are the only factories or the existing workplaces are the only ones that will ever exist. And over time, as they throw people out, of course, those people are going to be like the zombies in The Walking Dead. They're just going to be shuffling around looking for jobs and there's no new jobs. That forgets the fact that you're always sucking these people up into new uh, employment venues. The second thing is this. The automation that's throwing people out of work is the result of technological change, of new technologies, uh, of new machines, of new processes coming in place. And every one of those generates a demand for additional skills and additional workers to continue to produce those technologies, to service them, to uh, figure out how to make them better. Technological change is generating new occupations all the time. So it's always this dynamic process of one side of the equation 
throwing people out, but at the same time creating the conditions for those people to be sucked into new positions. Now, the key thing is this. Everything rides on the rate at which these two processes interact. Right now, the fears of automation leading to a desert and mass unemployment, those fears are stoked by a reality, which is that in the past 15 to 20 years, the pace of new employment generation has in fact been very slow. And because it's slow, we see the people who are being thrown out either not getting jobs or doing it, these gig jobs. Temporary work here, there, and here, there. That has to do with the fact, not that automation, we're finally seeing the true force of automation, its bare fangs actually visible once, uh, uh, for finally. It has to do with the fact that the, this particular era of capitalism in the West has been delivering very slow rates of growth, very low levels of reinvestment, and therefore very low levels of reemployment for the people being thrown out of work. Now that's why I said there's a kernel of truth to it, which is that that does change the conditions for organizing people. It's very different and in a ways quite, uh, I would say, a lot easier to organize people when everybody's sure of work, because then they're less afraid of their boss. What we're going through right now is a period in which people are so terrified, so beaten down, that in their jobs, in their workplaces, they are very, uh, much more afraid of raising their head, raising their fist, than they had been 60 or 80 or even 40 years ago. That means organization is a lot harder. And this is why the existing trade unions, one reason, it's a minor reason, there are much more shameful reasons, but it's one reason why trade unions are not really trying to organize new workers. Their strategy for 25 years has been essentially merge, mer uh, acquisitions and mergers. You raid other unions, you go to campuses, because students are already organized, and you say, the UAW says, see, we're organizing because we, we brought a bunch of grad students into our union. It's because it's a lot harder to, go, to walk into an auto plant. And it's not just harder because bosses have a lot of power over their workers, but the workers themselves are very much worried about the consequences of even taking a step because they know that it's a, it's a desert out there. Yeah, so I'm glad you said that. My next question was about unions. Uh, I mean, when we talk about the working class as the revolutionary agent of, of change, right? This seems very far away from where we are right now, certainly after 40 years of just you know, give backs and, and one-sided class attack. Um, Marxists have always supported trade unions, and I think that's the right position. You should say socialists. Marxists are just one strand within them. Socialists. Fair enough. So, socialists uh, support the trade unions, which I think is, is, is the right position. But, but the union movement, it's, it's, it's on its back in, in major ways, right? We, we, like each year in this country, union density f falls to a new low. Strike activity falls to a new low. Uh, most unions are, are now at this point run by bureaucrats who don't actually seem that interested in actually organizing their, their workers so much as sort of striking deals at the, at the top with little input from the unions. So given that, you know, given that we need the working class to act, how, how do socialists approach unions with, with, with all of this going on? So what you're asking is, um, there might be some reason to, to focus on workers, but are unions the best vehicle for trying to bring that about, mm -hmm. given where they are now? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we need to be flexible about this. The, the key point is, remember that it's not a moral issue per se, and it's not that there's some aesthetic Hegelian, we read about the master-servant dialectic and we think the workers are servants and we have to get to the chapter six of the phenomenology and therefore you go to the workers because, uh, you know, Horkheimer said so or something. <laughs> um, it's a practical issue, which is how do you bring capitalists to the table to say, okay, look, uh, we'll give you something. Yeah. Okay, and we have to be open to the fact that as capitalism evolves, maybe new possibilities open up for how we bring uh, poor people together. Okay. And maybe today there's a greater space for electoral politics because of the import, in, incredible role that the state plays in distributing income, perhaps. Maybe neighborhoods are a very important place because workers live there and they can aggregate themselves into larger numbers, perhaps in a way that in workplaces is not so easy. And we have to be open to all those things, certainly. But until we have practical reason and practical experience with these other forms of organization and other forms of interest aggregation, I don't see a way around keeping unions as a absolutely pivotal uh, um, mechanism, instrument within left strategy. If you, have, if you can find a better one, great. Let me know about it. I'll help you advertise the thing. I haven't been able to see one anywhere. And the, the last 20 years have been an interesting experiment in this way. I, I, don't, I don't know how many people think about this. The last five years alone, we've seen 
mass mobilizations all over the world. In the Middle East, which brought down a few regimes. In Brazil, in India, where I'm from, in this country. And what all of them have in common is that while labor has played varying degrees of role, organized labor in all of them, it hasn't really been at the core of any of them. The second thing they have in common is they've all met with defeat. They all had lots of people come out into the streets, and while they were in the streets, they made a great spectacle, but they didn't have a lot to show for it at the end of the day. Occupy is a very good example of that. It was a fantastic movement, and it really was the kind of the trigger that got a lot of the current mobilization going. But the difference between a factory occupation and a park occupation is just this, that people in the park have to go home. At some point, they're going to go home. And elites can just wait it out, because production is going on, profits are being made without any disruption. Factory occupations, however, are a whole different thing. So without figuring some way of having an institutional means of bringing workers together, like through a union, I don't know any way around it. It is absolutely true that the union movement today shows no interest in doing this. It shows no interest in fighting. It shows no interest in pursuing the kinds of the goals that the labor movement in the past had. To me, that just means you build a better one. That's all. It's like saying a cure for this disease is not doing as well as you could. But until you find a different cure, you've got to keep working on that one. And this is all we've seen. It's harder making this case today in left settings because there are very few workers who come to left settings. So it's harder to make the case that, the, now forget unions, that even that workers are important because a lot of people who are on the left are students and academics and you know, they want to talk about exotic things. But uh, I don't know any other way around it. So while we have to be very clear-eyed and uh, unromantic about where the labor movement is today and, uh, and uh, be aware of all of its infirmities and its liabilities, um, until we find a practical alternative, it seems to me that the only option we have is to make the existing kinds, sorts of institutions work better rather than abandoning them. So, so I'd like to ask, I guess, a follow-up question to that because it's it sort of speaks to again the the distance where where we are today from where we want to be, which is the level you know the degree to which workers are not immune from the the sort of prevailing ideas of society. There's you know the acceptance of racist ideas, sexist ideas, all kinds of ideas that that divide workers in in ways that are exactly unhelpful to forming these sorts of blocks that could, that can exert power. Are it's very very present, especially today. I mean, we turn the news on and see any number of examples of that, and. And unions in particular, and this is a vehicle that could be fighting against that, it sometimes is, but it's also increasingly not. Or you have some right-wing unions, the building trades, et cetera, that are actually taking on Trump's nationalism because they think it can save them a few uh, jobs in the short term. So we need to figure out how to overcome this. There's, a, you know, there's this sort of structural difficulty here. What, what, how, do we, how do we start getting a little closer to where we need to be? There's two difficulties. The fundamental, okay, let me say this first. The history of the union movement is not a linear one. The history of the union movement, not just here but everywhere, has been a, a kind of an internal conflict over what the shape and the goals of those unions are going to be. Mm -hmm. There's always been a ranchist kind of conservative wing which has tried to narrow down the range of issues they take up, simply build on the strength of the most um, skilled, the most privileged, and thereby sometimes the most conservative workers, and uh, aggregate power by uh, um, uh, monopolizing scarce resources and keeping other workers out. And that is, in many ways, to what we've returned today. But even in this country, and elsewhere, there's actually a very long and very noble tradition of trade unionists fighting for a wider uh, and more encompassing vision of what the labor movement is. In the United States, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, communists, socialists, few anarchists, uh, fought for that vision, and, and they had enormous success for it. Uh, one of the greatest and most important um, legacies of that uh, was the fact that in the 1920s and 30s, in Jim, the Jim Crow South, it was white communists, white trade unionists who were risking their lives organizing black workers with black sharecroppers who saw each other as comrades. That was inspired by a very particular vision 
of how to organize workers. That vision lost out, partly because of the internecine warfare within the labor movement in the 30s and 40s, partly because the American state came down on the side of the more conservative wing of the labor movement in order to make sure that the left didn't win out, which culminated in McCarthyism, from which the left never recovered. But we need to investigate that, be aware of it, and on the left, hold it up proudly and say, this is what we aspire to. That's something that I think we can return to today. And that brings me to the second problem. The second problem is this. There's nothing automatic in the labor movement that will push it towards a more encompassing vision of how to organize. There's nothing automatic about that. And in fact, there's many reasons why it's rational for workers to take the short term, the more conservative route, focus on their race, focus on their ethnicity, keep the women out, because it's easier. It's hard work going out and bridging these divides. In the past, it was the ideologically committed socialist left that came to unions and fought for this. The problem today is not just that the labor movement is more conservative, has this racism, has this exclusivist kind of ideology. It's also that people who call themselves socialists have no connection to labor. And to be honest, many of them are simply not interested because of this weight of the university and campus left. It's until the left gets outside the campus, out of the seminar room, until it starts opening up offices in working class neighborhoods, full-time organizers, gets jobs within that, until it implants itself within labor the way it always has until the 1970s and 80s. Until then, you have no way of bringing this alternative vision of organizing into the labor movement. And that's going to make it hard to move towards a more encompassing, more universalistic uh, form of class struggle in this country. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> on a positive note, we'll, uh, we'll let the folks at home uh, go home, uh, find a worker, talk to them. Uh, but we're going to kick it open to the people here for Q&A. Uh, so if, we'll, we'll open it up. If people want to form a line right here, we'll have a microphone set up, and then we'll... Uh, and then we'll have Vivek come back. So thank you, Vivek Tibber.